Chapters 71 through 79 of Against Celsus, Book 2, by Origen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Jesus taught us who it was that sent him in the words, quote, None knoweth the Father but the Son, end quote. And in these, quote, No man hath seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him, end quote. He, treating of deity, stated to his true disciples the doctrine regarding God, and we, discovering traces of such teaching in the scripture narratives, take occasion from such to aid our theological conceptions, hearing it declared in one passage that, quote, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all, end quote. And in another, quote, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit, and in truth, end quote. But the purposes for which the Father sent him are innumerable, and these any one may ascertain who chooses, partly from the prophets who prophesied of him, and partly from the narratives of the evangelists. And not a few things also will he learn from the apostles, and especially from Paul. Moreover, those who are pious he leadeth to the light, and those who sin he will punish, a circumstance which Celsus, not observing, has represented him, quote, as one who will lead the pious to the light, and who will have mercy on others, whether they sin or repent, end quote. After the above statements, he continues, quote, if he wished to remain hid, why was there heard a voice from heaven proclaiming him to be the Son of God? And if he did not seek to remain concealed, why was he punished? Or why did he die? End quote. Now, by such questions, he thinks to convict the histories of discrepancy, not observing that Jesus neither desired all things regarding himself to be known to all whom he happened to meet, nor yet all things to be unknown. Accordingly, the voice from heaven which proclaimed him to be the Son of God in the words, quote, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, end quote is not stated to have been audible to the multitudes as this Jew of Celsus supposed. The voice from the cloud on the high mountain, moreover, was heard only by those who had gone up with him. For the divine voice is of such a nature as to be heard only by those whom the speaker wishes to hear it. And I maintain that the voice of God which is referred to is neither air which has been struck, nor any concussion of the air nor anything else which is mentioned in treatises on the voice, and therefore it is heard by a better and more divine organ of hearing than that of sense. And when the speaker will not have his voice to be heard by all, he that has the finer ear hears the voice of God, while he who has the ears of the soul deadened does not perceive that it is God who speaks. These things I have mentioned because of his asking, quote, why was there heard a voice from heaven proclaiming him to be the Son of God? End quote. While with respect to the query, quote, Why was he punished if he wished to remain hid? End quote. What has been stated at greater length in the preceding pages on the subject of his sufferings may suffice. The Jew proceeds, after this, to state as a consequence what does not follow from the premises, for it does not follow from, quote, his having wished by the punishments which he underwent to teach us also to despise death, end quote, that after his resurrection he should openly summon all men to the light and instruct them in the object of his coming. For he had formerly summoned all men to the light in the words, quote, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, end quote. And the object of his coming had been explained at great length in his discourses on the Beatitudes, and in the announcements which followed them, and in the parables, and in his conversations with the scribes and Pharisees. And the instruction afforded us by the Gospel of John shows that the eloquence of Jesus consisted not in words, but in deeds, while it is manifest from the Gospel narratives that his speech was, quote, with power, end quote, on which account also they marveled at him. In addition to all this, the Jew further says, quote, 
All these statements are taken from your own books, in addition to which we need no other witness, for ye fall upon your own swords. End quote. Now we have proved that many foolish assertions opposed to the narratives of our Gospels occur in the statements of the Jew, either with respect to Jesus or ourselves. And I do not think that he has shown that, quote, we fall upon our own swords, end quote, but he only so imagines. And when the Jew adds, in a general way, this to his former remarks, quote, O most high and heavenly one, what God, on appearing to men, is received with incredulity, end quote, we must say to him that according to the accounts in the law of Moses, God is related to have visited the Hebrews in a most public manner, not only in the signs and wonders performed in Egypt, and also in the passage of the Red Sea, and in the pillar of fire and cloud of light, but also when the Decalogue was announced to the whole people, and yet was received with incredulity by those who saw these things. For had they believed what they saw and heard, they would not have fashioned the calf, nor change their own glory into the likeness of a grass-eating calf. Nor would they have said to one another, with reference to the calf, quote, These be thy gods, O Israel, who brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. End quote. And observe whether it is not entirely in keeping with the character of the same people, who formerly refused to believe such wonders and such appearances of divinity throughout the whole period of wandering in the wilderness as they are recorded in the law of the Jews to have done, to refuse to be convinced also, on occasion of the glorious advent of Jesus, by the mighty words which were spoken by him with authority, and the marvels which he performed in the presence of all the people. I think what has been stated is enough to convince any one that the unbelief of the Jews with regard to Jesus was in keeping with what is related of this people from the beginning. For I would say in reply to this Jew of Celsus when he asks, quote, What God that appeared among men is received with incredulity, and that, too, when appearing to those who expect him, or why, pray, is he not recognized by those who have been long looking for him? End quote. What answer, friends, would you have us return to your questions? Which class of miracles in your judgment do you regard as the greater? Those which were wrought in Egypt and the wilderness, or those which we declare that Jesus performed among you? For if the former are, in your opinion, greater than the latter, does it not appear from this very fact to be in conformity with the character of those who disbelieved the greater to despise the less? And this is the opinion entertained with respect to our accounts of the miracles of Jesus. But if those related of Jesus are considered to be as great as those recorded of Moses, what strange thing has come to pass among a nation which has manifested incredulity with regard to the commencement of both dispensations. For the beginning of the legislation was in the time of Moses, in whose work are recorded the sins of the unbelievers and wicked among you, while the commencement of our legislation and second covenant is admitted to have been in the time of Jesus. And by your unbelief of Jesus, ye show that ye are the sons of those who, in the desert, discredited the divine appearances, and thus what was spoken by our Savior will be applicable also to you who believe not on him. Quote, Therefore ye bear witness that ye allow the deeds of your fathers. End quote. And there is fulfilled among you also the prophecy which said, quote, Your life shall hang in doubt before your eyes, and ye will have no assurance of your life. End quote. For ye did not believe in the life which came to visit the human race. Celsus, in adopting the character of a Jew, could not discover any objections to be urged against the gospel which might not be retorted on him as liable to be brought against the law and the prophets. For he censures Jesus in such words as the following, quote, He makes use of threats and reviles men on light grounds when he says, Woe unto you, and... I tell you beforehand, for by such expressions he manifestly acknowledges his inability to persuade, and this would not be the case with a god or even a prudent man. End quote. Observe, now, 
whether these charges do not manifestly recoil upon the Jew. For in the writings of the law and the prophets, God makes use of threats and revilings when he employs language of not less severity than that found in the gospel, such as the following expressions of Isaiah, quote, Woe unto them that join house to house and lay field to field, and woe unto them that rise up early in the morning that they may follow strong drinks, and woe unto them that draw their sins after them as with a long rope, and woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, and woe unto those of you who are mighty to drink wine, end quote and innumerable other passages of the same kind. And does not the following resemble the threats of which he speaks? Quote, ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evil doers, children that are corruptors, End quote. and so on, to which he subjoins such threats as are equal in severity to those which he says Jesus made use of. For is it not a threatening and a great one which declares, quote, your country is desolate, your cities are burned with fire, your land strangers devour it in your presence, and it is desolate as overthrown by strangers." End quote. And are there not revilings in Ezekiel directed against the people when the Lord says to the prophet, quote, Thou dwellest in the midst of scorpions. End quote. Were you serious, then, Celsus, in representing the Jew as saying of Jesus that, quote, he makes use of threats and revilings on slight grounds when he employs the expressions, woe unto you, and I tell you beforehand, end quote. Do you not see that the charges which this Jew of yours brings against Jesus might be brought by him against God? For the God who speaks in the prophetic writings is manifestly liable to the same accusations as Celsus regards them of inability to persuade. I might, moreover, say to this Jew, who thinks that he makes a good charge against Jesus by such statements, that if he undertakes in support of the scriptural account to defend the numerous curses recorded in the books of Leviticus and Deuteronomy, we should make as good, or better, a defense of the revilings and threatenings which are regarded as having been spoken by Jesus. And, as respects the law of Moses itself, we are in a position to make a better defense of it than the Jew is, because we have been taught by Jesus to have a more intelligent apprehension of the writings of the law. Nay, if the Jew perceive the meaning of the prophetic scriptures, he will be able to show that it is for no light reason that God employs threatenings and revilings when he says, quote, Woe unto you, and I tell you beforehand, end quote. And how should God employ such expressions for the conversion of men, which Celsus thinks that even a prudent man would not have recourse to? But Christians, who know only one God, the same who spoke in the prophets and in the Lord Jesus, can prove the reasonableness of those threatenings and revilings as Celsus considers and entitles them. And here a few remarks shall be addressed to the Celsus, who professes both to be a philosopher and to be acquainted with all our system. How is it, friend, when Hermes, in Homer, says to Odysseus, quote, Why, now, wretched man, do you come wandering alone over the mountain tops? End quote. That you are satisfied with the answer which explains that the Homeric Hermes addresses such language to Odysseus to remind him of his duty because it is characteristic of the sirens to flatter and to say pleasing things around whom, quote, is a huge heap of bones, end quote, and who say, quote, come hither, much lauded Odysseus, great glory to the Greeks, end quote. Whereas, if our prophets and Jesus himself, in order to turn their hearers from evil, make use of such expressions as, quote, woe unto you, end quote, and what you regard as revilings, there is no condensation in such language to the circumstances of the hearers, nor any application of such words to them as healing medicine. Unless, indeed, you would have God, or one who partakes of the divine nature, when conversing with men, to have regard to his own nature alone, and to what is worthy of himself, but to have no regard to what is fitting to be brought before men who are under the dispensation and leading of his word, 
and with each one of whom he is to converse agreeably to his individual character and it is not a ridiculous assertion regarding jesus to say that he was unable to persuade men when you compare the state of matters not only among the jews who have many such instances recorded in the prophecies but also among the greeks among whom all of those who have attained great reputation for their wisdom have been unable to persuade those who conspired against them or to induce their judges or accusers to cease from evil and to endeavor to attain to virtue by the way of philosophy after this the jew remarks manifestly in accordance with the jewish belief quote, we certainly hope that there will be a bodily resurrection and that we shall enjoy an eternal life and the example and archetype of this will be he who is sent to us and who will show that nothing is impossible with god End quote. we do not know indeed whether the jew would say of the expected christ that he exhibits in himself an example of the resurrection but let it be supposed that he both thinks and says so we shall give this answer then to him who has told us that he drew his information from our own writings Quote, did you read these writings friend in which you think you discover matter of accusation against us and not find there the resurrection of jesus and the declaration that he was the firstborn from the dead or because you will not allow such things to have been recorded were they not actually recorded End quote. but as the jew still admits the resurrection of the body i do not consider the present a suitable time to discuss this subject with one who believes and says that there is a bodily resurrection whether he has an articulate understanding of such a topic and is able to plead well on its behalf or not but has only given his assent to it as being of a legendary character let the above then be our reply to this jew of celsus and when he adds quote, where then is he that we may see him and believe upon him End quote. we answer where is he now who spoke in the prophecies and who wrought miracles that we may see and believe that he is part of god are you to be allowed to meet the objection that god does not perpetually show himself to the hebrew nation while we are not to be permitted the same defense with regard to jesus who has both once risen himself and led his disciples to believe in his resurrection and so thoroughly persuaded them of its truth that they show to all men by their sufferings how they are able to laugh at all the troubles of life beholding the life eternal and the resurrection clearly demonstrated to them both in word and deed the jew continues quote, did jesus come into the world for this purpose that we should not believe him End quote. to which we immediately answer that he did not come with the object of producing incredulity among the jews but knowing beforehand that such would be the result he foretold it and made use of their unbelief for the calling of the gentiles for through their sin salvation came to the gentiles respecting whom the christ who speaks in the prophecies says quote, a people whom i did not know became subject to me they were obedient to the hearing of my ear End quote. and quote, i was found of them who sought me not i became manifest to those who inquired not after me End quote. it is certain moreover that the jews were punished even in this present life after treating jesus in the manner in which they did and let the jews assert what they will when we charge them with guilt and say quote, is not the providence and goodness of god most wonderfully displayed in your punishment and in your being deprived of jerusalem and of the sanctuary and of your splendid worship End quote. for whatever they may say in reply with respect to the providence of god we shall be able more effectually to answer it by remarking that the providence of god was wonderfully manifested in using the transgression of that people for the purpose of calling into the kingdom of god through jesus christ those from among the gentiles who were strangers to the covenant and aliens to the promises and these things were foretold by the prophets who said that on account of the transgressions of the hebrew nation god would make choice not of a nation but of individuals chosen from all lands and 
having selected the foolish things of the world would cause an ignorant nation to become acquainted with the divine teaching the kingdom of god being taken from the one and given to the other and out of a larger number it is sufficient on the present occasion to adduce the prediction from the song in deuteronomy regarding the calling of the gentiles which is as follows being spoken in the person of the lord quote, they have moved me to jealousy with those who are not gods they have provoked me to anger with their idols and i will move them to jealousy with those who are not a people i will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation End quote. the conclusion of all these arguments regarding jesus is thus stated by the jew quote, he was therefore a man and of such a nature as the truth itself proves and reason demonstrates him to be End quote. i do not know however whether a man who had the courage to spread throughout the entire world his doctrine of religious worship and teaching could accomplish what he wished without the divine assistance and could rise superior to all who withstood the progress of his doctrine kings and rulers and the roman senate and governors in all places and the common people and how could the nature of a man possessed of no inherent excellence convert so vast a multitude for it would not be wonderful if it were only the wise who were so converted but it is most irrational of men and those devoted to their passions and who by reason of their irrationality change with the greater difficulty so as to adopt a more temperate course of life and yet it is because christ was the power of god and the wisdom of the father that he accomplished and still accomplishes such results although neither the jews nor greeks who disbelieve his word will so admit and therefore we shall not cease to believe in god according to the precepts of jesus christ and to seek to convert those who are blind on the subject of religion although it is they who are truly blind themselves that charge us with blindness and they whether jews or greeks who lead astray those that follow them accuse us of seducing men a good seduction truly that they may become temperate instead of dissolute or at least may make advances to temperance may become just instead of unjust or at least may tend to become so prudent instead of foolish or be on the way to become such and instead of cowardice meanness and timidity may exhibit the virtues of fortitude and courage especially displayed in the struggles undergone for the sake of their religion towards god the creator of all things jesus christ therefore came announced beforehand not by one prophet but by all and it was a proof of the ignorance of celsus to represent a jew as saying that one prophet only had predicted the advent of christ but as this jew of celsus after being thus introduced asserting that these things were indeed in conformity with his own law has somewhere here ended his discourse with a mention of other matters not worthy of remembrance i too shall here terminate the second book of my answer to his treatise but if god permit and the power of christ abide in my soul i shall endeavor in the third book to deal with the subsequent statements of celsus and of against celsus book two by origin of alexandria translated by frederick crombie read by david ronald